Would you remain standing, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word and turn with me in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Last Sunday morning, we began a new series of sermons through the book of Ecclesiastes and tried to provide something of an introduction to this book Last Sunday and this morning, we begin in earnest looking together at this text. So Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Let us hear the word of the Lord together this morning. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind. And on its circuits, the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. May God bless the reading and hearing of His Word. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, one of the best ways to get someone's attention and to draw them in to get them to engage with you is to ask them a question. It's to simply ask them a question. Because a question is an invitation for involvement. It invites someone to be involved with you. It is an invitation to join you in thinking about something or in talking about something. It invites participation. A question pulls you in. You're not left as an outsider, merely observing the conversation. No, a question invites you to become a participant in the conversation. Let me try to illustrate this for you. Think about the different way you react to me simply telling you, I want you to think about the beach versus me asking you, when was the last time you were at the beach? What beach was it? What comes into your mind as you think about that beach. Now, chances are, by simply asking that question, I've drawn you in. I've invited you. I've encouraged you to now become a part of the conversation. You're not just thinking sort of in abstract terms. I've invited you to actually start thinking about your own experiences and to think with me and join me in thinking about the beach. Those questions have invited you in. They've drawn you in. And now you're more willing to go along with me because you actually feel like you're a part of the conversation now. 
You, you see the difference? Now, I realize that in making my point, I probably lost most of you for the rest of the sermon because now you're thinking about the beach. Um, so let, let's come back together because the point that I'm trying to make and hopefully I've made is simply the, the fact that one of the best ways to draw people in and to get them to think with you about something is to ask them a question. It invites their participation. And here, in the opening passage of Ecclesiastes, the preacher wants us to join him in thinking about something. He wants to engage us. He wants to invite us in and to join him in thinking about something. And what he wants us to think about, what he wants us to consider, is this statement that he makes in verse 2, which is sort of his thesis statement that he's going to repeat often throughout this book, that all is vanity. As we talked about last Sunday, this idea really is that all is vapor, just like a puff of smoke, that everything in this life feels frustrating because it's so elusive. It's just like a puff of smoke. Now, that's quite a statement. That is quite a claim for Solomon to make to say that everything is vanity. It's all a vapor. And he doesn't want us just to pass by that statement. He doesn't want to just make it and then move on. He makes it and then he wants us to grapple with that statement, to join him in thinking about that statement. He wants us to give that statement our attention. He wants us to consider what it is he's saying here. And so how does he invite us to do that? How does he get us to join him in thinking about this truth? By asking a question. So in the very next verse, in verse 3, Solomon asks us a question. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Now, he's just made this incredible statement that everything is vain, everything is a vapor, that it's all vanity. And then to drive that home, to get us to really think about that, he wants us to ponder a question. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Now, by asking us this question, he's involving us. Right? He's giving us an invitation to join him in considering what he's saying, to, to join him in thinking about this. And it's a fascinating question that he raises. It's one that we sometimes ask ourselves. Because think of what he is asking here in verse 3. At the end of the day, what do we actually gain? from all of our hard work in this world? What do we actually gain? What, what is the net gain for us? We toil away all day long in this fallen, frustrating world, but do we ever actually gain anything? What's the profit? What's the payoff? What's the reward? What do we have to show for all of our effort? Do we ever actually accomplish anything? That's the question that he is wanting us to think about, to consider with him. Now, you may not recognize it right away, but this question is loaded with very intentional language. It's loaded with language that is meant to remind us and to take our minds back to the opening chapters of Genesis. In fact, the opening chapters of Genesis are never far from Solomon's mind in Ecclesiastes. And it's certainly not far from his mind here. In fact, he uses words that are meant to take us back to the opening chapters of Genesis. Because the Hebrew word that he uses there in verse 3 for man, it's the word Adam. Adam. What does Adam gain? And thus, what do all of Adam's descendants 
gain by all the toil. Toil, there's another word from the opening chapters of Genesis. You may remember this is the word that's used to characterize our work in this fallen world. It's, it just, it's the word that describes our work after the fall. It's our work in a world that is now characterized by thorns and thistles. It's our work in a world that is under the curse of sin. It is our work in a world where work has been frustrated and complicated because of the fall. So what do the sons and daughters of Adam gain by all their toil that they toil away under the sun? That is, in this fallen and frustrating world. What do we have to show for all of our effort, for all of our hard work? What do we have to show for all of our activity, for all the hours we punch in and punch out? What do we have to show for all the energy we expend every day, for all the things we do, for all the items we check off our to-do list? What gain, what profit do we have from it all? That's the question that Solomon is inviting us to consider with him. And now that we're considering it, now that we're thinking about this question, now that he's drawn us in, now that we're mulling over these things in our mind, now Solomon wants to take us somewhere. Now that we're willing to go with him in this conversation, now he wants to provide an answer to that question. And what Solomon wants to help us see is that the answer to that question is not much. (laughs) Nothing, really. In fact, Solomon wants us to realize in the rest of this passage, as we consider his answer to this question, he wants us to realize a very sobering truth. He wants us to realize that one of the reasons we seem to have nothing to show for all of our work, one of the reasons why everything seems to be vanity, just a vapor, one of the reasons why life in a fallen world is so frustrating is because it is a cycle of repetitive monotony. It is a cycle of repetitive monotony. For all of our activity, for all of our hard work, We don't ever actually seem to make much progress and get anywhere. We never seem to make a a real lasting difference. We, We never seem to do something that actually changes things. Now, that's a real pick me up, I know, but it's true. And that's what the preacher wants us to see and realize in these verses. And he's going to illustrate the truth of this reality, this cycle of repetitive monotony. He's going to illustrate it from causing us to look at the world around us and what we can observe from it. So look at what he says in verse 4. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. So first, he points to the cycle of the generation. He says there's a generation on the scene, but then it goes. It passes from the scene. And what happens as a result of that generation going on? Does does the world stop? Does anything change? What happens? Nothing happens. Another generation just comes right behind it. And eventually, that generation will go too. And then what happens? Another generation comes right behind it. And the cycle just keeps repeating itself over and over again. And all the while, the earth remains. From dust we came and to dust we shall return. And yet the earth just keeps spinning. And we just keep coming and going. Coming and going. The younger generation is always becoming the older generation. And over and over the cycle repeats itself. So let me speak to those of you who are children or youth for just a moment, maybe even college students. I want to speak directly to you for just a minute. I want you to imagine something that may be quite difficult for you to imagine, but it's true. 
your grandparents were once kids and teenagers. Now, I know that, that seems like impossible to imagine and to fathom, but it's true that they were once your age. Now, I know for some of our kids and youth, I've just blown their minds, and now they're gone for the rest of the sermon, but, but it's true. Your grandparents were once your age. Now, this may be even more difficult for you to fathom. It won't be long before you are your grandparents' age. You're going to be an old man and an old woman. And your grandchildren are going to think that it was really weird for you to be a child and a teenager. That's just the way it goes. That's just the way life is. The generations keep coming and keep going. They keep coming and they keep going. And they just keep cycling over and over. The cycle just keeps repeating itself. One generation comes, another generation goes. But notice, Solomon says it's not just that this cycle is repetitive. It begins to get exhausting and monotonous for us. It can feel like we're doing all of this work, but we're never getting anywhere. Look at what he says in verse 5. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. So not only is this cycle seen in the coming and going of the generations, it's also seen in the rising and setting of the sun. So the sun rises and then it goes down. And then what does it do the next day? It rises and then it goes down. What about the next day? It rises and then it goes down. And what has it been doing since the beginning of creation? Rising and going down. Rising, going down. Over and over and over again. And that cycle just keeps repeating itself. And look again at the way it's described there in verse 5. The sun rises and the sun goes down and it hastens, hurries to the place where it rises. It's pictured as running, hurrying to get back to rise again. And your English Bible may have a footnote there by the word hasten. Mine does, and if you look down at what that footnote says, it says that that word can actually be translated and returns panting. The sun rises and it goes down and it returns panting to the place where it rises, like it's out of breath from all its work, from having to do this perpetual rising and setting, rising and setting, and then it just hurries back, weary and exhausted from the journey, but it has no time to rest. Its tongue is hanging out, just tired of all its work, but it has to hurry because it's got to do it all again the next day. And it's that way over and over and over. For all of the sun's weary activity, it never seems to get anywhere. Never makes any progress. Just goes in circles over and over again. Then he says, consider the wind. Verse 6, the wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind. And on its circuits, the wind returns. He says the wind is the same way. It blows to the south, and then it goes around to the north, and then it goes back again, and it repeats itself over and over. Around and around and around it goes. Over and over. The wind just keeps circling, never making any progress. And then the preacher invites us to consider the waters. Look at verse 7. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. He says, think about the streams. They they just keep running into the sea, but the sea never gets full. And so they just keep returning to where they flow from, and they just keep doing this over and over. The streams just keep flowing, but it doesn't ever seem to actually change anything. The Mississippi River keeps flowing into the Gulf of Mexico and spilling into the Atlantic Ocean. But guess what? The Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean never seem to change. They never seem to get any deeper or never really affects anything. Or consider the geography that Solomon would have been familiar with. The Jordan River. 
it keeps flowing down into and emptying into the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea has no outlet. But guess what? The Dead Sea never gets deeper. It never gets full. It's not affecting anything. And so this cycle just keeps repeating itself over and over to seemingly no effect. It's just this endless cycle. The rivers keep flowing into the sea, but the job is never done. They have to keep doing it over and over again because the sea is never satisfied. It never gets enough water. And so the rivers must keep flowing over and over again, even though they never seem to make any progress and never seem to have anything to actually show for their work. Brothers and sisters, is any of this sounding familiar? Does this not reflect something of our own lives and of our own experiences? Don't we know something of this feeling of repetitive monotony? Of the same old, same old day after day? I mean, don't we know something of this frustration like, We are the hamsters just spinning in the wheel, doing a lot of work, but never actually getting anywhere, never making any progress. We don't like to admit it, but if we're honest, much of our lives feel like we are just living in the movie Groundhog Day. We're just living the same day over and over and over again. Nothing seems to change. Day in, day out, everything just seems to to drag on. Day after day, month after month, year after year. And it just feels like it's the same thing over and over again. To put it in the words of the famous philosopher Yogi Berra, it it feels like every day is deja vu all over again. Right? I mean, that's just sort of how we feel. There's a monotony and a drudgery to it all. Think about it. You expend all of that energy to wash all of those dishes that are in the sink. And you finally are done. And then, what do you find the very next day? A sink full of dirty dishes again. Right? You spend all that time to get all the clothes washed and folded and put away. And then later that day, what do you see? A hamper full of more dirty clothes. It just never ends. Students, you you spend all of that time getting all of your homework done and you finally get it all done and you breathe a sigh of relief. But guess what? You're going to have more tomorrow. (laughs) It's just the way it works. After I get done preaching a sermon, you know what thought comes into my mind maybe two minutes after the benediction? Next Sunday's coming. i got to do it all over again. That's just the way it is. You mow the grass. And it's done. It looks great. But guess what? you got to mow it again. You pull the weeds. And the flower bed looks great for about two hours, and then the weeds are back again. You answer all of your emails, and there's that satisfying feeling of seeing zero by your inbox. But you know that's not going to last. You're going to get behind again. That's just the way life is in this fallen world. There's always something else to do. The job is never done. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating for us. We can't ever seem to catch our breath. We're just sort of panting, running to the next thing. We put forth all of this effort. We work hard, and yet we seem to have nothing to show for it. There's always more to do. It's an endless cycle. And it's exhausting. That's why verse 8 begins the way it does. All things are full of weariness. All things are full of weariness. I mean, it just just makes us tired thinking about it. Some of you just are getting tired thinking about the dishes that are waiting on you. It it just exhausts us. We we feel sympathy for the sun, right? We, We know what it's like to sort of go with our tongue hanging out, wagging to the next day, knowing we are exhausted from all we've just done, only to have to do it all over again. And all over again. And all over again baffles us that this is the way life is. That's why the very next part of verse 8 says, a man cannot utter it. A man cannot utter it. 
just confuses and frustrates us. We can't explain it. We, we, we can't really fully understand it. We just know that this is the way it is. And worse, nothing ever seems to satisfy us. Nothing ever seems to actually give us contentment or fill us. Look at the rest of verse 8. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. In other words, it doesn't matter what we see or how much we see. It doesn't matter what we may hear or how much we may hear. It's never enough. Nothing is ever enough for us. Nothing ever satisfies us. We keep looking. We keep waiting. We keep hoping for something that will change the cycle, that will break the monotony. We're just like the sea that is never full. We're never content. Nothing ever seems to satisfy us. We are like kids two days after Christmas already bored with the brand new toys that we just got. Waiting for something new. Waiting for the next thing that we think will satisfy us and fill us. Friends, this is why people change jobs. This is why people change cities. This is sadly why people change spouses. This is why. This is what is driving them. It is this sort of frustration to the world in which we live. We keep assuming that the next thing will make us happy, will actually fill us. Here's the way one preacher put it. He said, we keep waiting for a change in our circumstances that will make us happy. And honestly, we live our entire lives like that. As a teenager, you're frustrated under the lack of freedom in your parents' house, and you think to yourself, I can't wait till I get my driver's license and I go to college because then, then I'll be free and happy. Then you get to college and you think, I can't wait to get out of all this boring studying and start doing a job I really love. And then you graduate. And you take the job and you say to yourself, if only I could find someone to love and get married, then, then I would be happy. And then you find someone. And you fall in love and you get married and you think, if I could just have a family, if we could just start a family, then, then life would be complete. So you have kids. And then you think, if I could just get promoted at work so I could make more money to provide for my family, then, then, and the cycle never ends. It never ends. We just keep living for the next then. We keep thinking, if I can just get there, everything will be different. But when you get there, nothing is different. Oh, sure, you, you may have a change of address, but it's the same problem. No matter the changes we try to manufacture, in the end, nothing really changes. We're still faced with the same old problems. There's nothing really new. That's why Solomon says what he says there in verse 9. Actually, 9 through 11, look at it. He says, what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It's already been in the ages before us. He's trying to help us see, don't, don't chase after the next thing, the new thing, because there is nothing new. Verse 11, there's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. So Solomon has been pointing our attention to the natural world. Now he points our attention to history. And he says, think about history. Because history is just like nature. We tend to think of it as linear, right? We, we tend to think of it as moving along the, the spectrum and, and humanity is actually making progress. But truthfully, history is cyclical as well. As one commentator put it, there's nothing really new in our world, only reruns. <laughs> it's just the same sort of things 
that have always gone on. They, they, they may be dressed in different clothes. They may have different hairstyles. They may use different forms of communication. But it's fundamentally the same as it's always been. There's nothing really new in this fallen world. We're, we're still the same bunch of sinners that we've always been. And we still have to deal with the same old problems that humanity has always had to deal with. That's why he says there in verse 10, is there really a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? Is there anything that can really be called new? Now, understand, he's not saying that we never discover anything new or that uh, we don't make some sort of advances or invent anything new. That, that's not what he's saying. He's not suggesting that the ancient Israelites wouldn't be dumbfounded if you put an iPad in their hands. That's not what he's saying. What he's getting at is that for all of our inventions, for all of our advances in technology, we haven't changed the unalterable facts of our existence one bit. Nothing has changed. We haven't stopped the generations from going and coming. We haven't stopped the sun from rising and setting. We haven't changed the cycle at all. We haven't changed the fact that we're born, we toil and labor, and then we die. And the earth just keeps spinning. That hasn't changed one bit. Nothing has happened to change that. And he says, the generations to come, who are going to come after us, they won't remember us. They don't even remember the things that we think are significant. Look at what he says in verse 11. There's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Think about this. For many of us, September the 11th was an unforgettable day with unforgettable events. But to our middle schoolers, it's just another date on a history quiz. And that was just 19 years ago. That's how quick things are forgotten. You want to get an idea of how quickly things and people are forgotten go to one of our children's Sunday school classes or one of our youth Sunday school classes and ask them to name one of the Beatles they were going to be more famous than Jesus right ask them to name one of the Beatles or, or ask them about Shirley Temple or Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid Ask them about Andy Griffith, or Cheers, or MASH. Ask them about George Jetson. Ask them about Screech, or Urkel, or New Kids on the Block. You will get a blank stare. And guess what? It won't be long before someone asks someone to, about your name. And you won't be remembered either. You remember your great great grandparents? Chances are the answer is no. Neither will your great great grandchildren remember you. We live, we die, and then we're forgotten. And then the cycle repeats itself over and over and over. You say, well, that's not really a very uplifting message. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not. But here's the thing. It's true. It's true. And there is benefit to us in recognizing and admitting that it's true. So here's the way I want to close this morning. I want to close with two points of application from what we see here. Because I want you to realize that, number one, there is wisdom in these words. I want you to re recognize it. There is wisdom in these words. And then number two, there is hope beyond these words. There is hope beyond these words. So first, I want you to see and realize that there is wisdom in these words. Don't just dismiss a passage like this 
because it's sobering, because it's so blunt, because you don't really like what it has to say. No, recognize that there is wisdom in what Solomon tells us here. And there are at least two nuggets of wisdom that I want you to recognize. Here's the first nugget of wisdom. Accept the reality of death rather than trying to avoid it. Accept the reality of death rather than trying to avoid it. You may not realize this, but the first step in learning to live is accepting that you're going to die. That's the first step in wise living. It's just accepting the reality of death. No matter how hard you may try, you're not going to outrun death. You may be young right now, but blink and you'll be old. You may be a part of the generation that's coming, but I promise you it won't be long till you're a part of the generation that's going. It's just the way life is. It's why it's a vapor. That's why it's described the way it's described here. And the sooner you accept that, the better your perspective will be on life and the wiser you will be. As one writer put it, the truly wise person is the one who knows the length of his tether. He knows how long he's got. And it affects everything else. Or here's the way Psalm 90 would put it. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. There's something that teaches us wisdom when knowing that we're not going to live forever on this fallen world. So that's the first nugget of wisdom. Accept the reality of death rather than trying to avoid it. Here's the second nugget of wisdom from this text. Accept the limitations of this world rather than attempting to break free of them. Accept the limitations of this world rather than attempting to break free of them. In other words, accept the reality of this cycle of repetitive monotony that Solomon describes here in this passage. Because if you don't accept this reality... You are going to live your whole life thinking that if you can just get something different, if you can just get something new, if you can just have something waiting for you around the corner, then that thing will make you happy. That that thing will finally bring you contentment. That that thing will finally fill you. And what the Word of God is trying to get into your head and into your heart is that that is an illusion. That is a mirage. That is a lie. That is not wisdom. Wisdom is recognizing that there is a built-in pattern to this world that God has made that feels repetitive and feels monotonous at times, but acting like that isn't real is not going to change it. And it is not wise. It's foolish. We need the wisdom to recognize that living in a fallen, frustrating world means that we must accept that the next thing or the new thing is never going to satisfy us or give us contentment. Those new things were never meant to do that. The new job, the new house, more money, or whatever it is you assume will finally bring you happiness. It's not going to do it. It's just not. And there is wisdom in recognizing that reality. So we need to stop pretending that those things will bring us contentment. So we need to accept the limitations of this fallen world rather than constantly trying to break free of the cycle. But, brothers and sisters, that doesn't mean that there is no hope or that there is no joy. Listen, if you stuck with me this long, then don't check out here. Because I'm telling you that there is joy to be found. We're almost done, but you need to realize this last point. You need to realize that not only is there wisdom in these words, there is hope beyond these words. Yes, we need to recognize that a book like Ecclesiastes is in the Bible, and it's in the Bible for a reason. There is wisdom for us to learn here, and we shouldn't ignore it. We shouldn't overlook it. 
But we must also recognize that while it is indeed part of the Bible, it is not the only part of the Bible. There is more. And for all that Solomon knew, we know more of the story than Solomon knew. We know that there is a man who actually gained something from all his toil. There is another Adam who actually accomplished something of significance in his work, who actually got the job done. There is one who finally broke the cycle, who actually did something new, who is actually worthy to be remembered. Because when Jesus Christ went to do the work that he was sent here to do, when he was lifted up on Calvary's cross to die in our place, to suffer our punishment, to bear the curse for our sins, he could say what we never ever seem to be able to say it is finished the job is finally done the ransom has been paid reconciliation has been provided redemption has been won sinners have been saved he provided the once for all sacrifice for sin. It never, ever has to be repeated again. Our salvation is secure. That's why right now He is seated at the right hand of His Father, resting from His work. He can sit down because the job is done. And even though they took His dead body down from the cross and placed it in a tomb, up from the grave he arose never to die again you talk about something new the resurrection of jesus christ was truly something new that was new and because of it he ushers in all kinds of new realities for us because now what does he offers us? He offers us new birth. He offers us new life. He makes us new creation. He makes us part of the new covenant. And one day he will bring to this fallen and frustrating world the day when he will say, behold, I am making all things new. I am making a new heaven and a new earth. And that's why we remember him. That's why he will never be forgotten. That's why we still sing of Him. That's why 2,000 years later, generations have come and generations have gone, but we have never gotten over the wonder of what He accomplished for us. That's why we still sing today, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Friends, if you are looking for good news this morning, if you are looking for hope this morning, then stop looking within yourself. Stop looking for satisfaction and contentment in things in this fallen, frustrating world and look to Jesus Christ. Look to the One who actually gained something on your behalf. Look to the One who suffered and bled and died for you. The One who broke the cycle of sin and death for you. And look to the One who can make it possible for you to actually accept the reality of death because He has already won the victory over death. He is the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in Him, though He die, yet shall He live. So learn to say and sing with us of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray together. Oh God, would you, by your Spirit, take the truth of your Word and plant it deep within our hearts and minds today. May we truly see and learn and appreciate the wisdom that is found here in your Word. But may we also rejoice in the hope that is found beyond these words. In the One greater than Solomon. In the true Son of David. Your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we say of him this morning, hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen.